Welcome to lecture 16 of MCS 471, uh, numerical analysis. So we will continue our discussion on approximating uh, data and functions. We will end uh, the chapter on interpolation. Um, so we will cover Chebyshev interpolation. And then starting from Taylor series, we will construct rational approximations, also called Pade approximations. Um, so Chebyshev polynomials uh, feature prominently in this lecture. Uh, we will also encounter Chebyshev polynomials again when we consider numerical integration. So what is the problem? Well, we would like to minimize the interpolation error by choosing the interpolation points in a better way. So let us look how we could we possibly do that. So what is the full problem statement? Uh, we have data, and in this lecture we assume that there is some function uh, there, and we would like to replace that function by a polynomial. So we have seen that the problem has a unique solution if all interpolation points, if all the xi's are different from the xj's. Uh, we define the coefficient problem, the value problem. We covered Lagrange interpolation and the interpolation of Neville, respectively for the coefficient problem and the value problem. In the last lecture, we have seen that Newton interpolation solves both the coefficient and the value problem. And one can interpret the Newton form of the interpolating polynomial as a discrete analog of the Taylor series. And Newton interpolation is also an iterative method. Look at the last divided difference that you computed, and that actually gives you a measure for the accuracy on how good the approximations. So last time we got better approximations by incrementally adding points, uh, a little bit in that hoc fashion, you start with some very coarse equidistant grid and then you add points ad hoc uh, not ad hoc well ad hoc if you look at the plot uh, but perhaps not so much ad hoc if you use the next term rule now instead of an incremental choice what if you could determine whether if you what if you are free to choose your points wherever you like um, what is then the best choice of the interpolation points? And in particular, what choice of the interpolation points minimizes the interpolation error? So it's actually also a minimax uh, problem. We want to minimize uh, the error, uh, but we want to maximize the accuracy. Or if you like, it's both a minimum problem. We want to use as few points as possible. All right, so our running example is the sine function. Uh, so here is another approximation for the sine function, also with uh, also an interpolating approximation. And like we did last time, we're also using six points. But you can see that, or perhaps you cannot see, uh, it may not be completely obvious here, the points are actually no longer equidistant. Uh, so we will be using the roots of the Chebyshev uh, polynomials. Uh, now, for us to see this at the picture, uh, it's not immediately clear that this is a better approximation than when we picked uh, six equidistant. Well, actually, the six points that we were using last time were chosen incrementally. So forget about this, they are not equidistant. So we, we were kind of constructing our six points in an ad hoc fashion. Here we are doing this in a more systematic manner uh, by 
uh, picking roots of the Chebyshev polynomials. And this will actually turn out better. Um, perhaps, and most likely not, you remember uh, most likely not the interpolation error. Uh, but the interpolation error back then was about 200 uh, maximum over the interval. And now you see that almost everywhere this is less than uh, one tenth uh, instead of uh, two tenths. Or, or um, I'm sorry, it's, it's less than 100 instead of uh, two one hundredths. So we have almost everywhere almost everywhere except for those peaks here so here is where the error gets larger and here is also where the error gets larger but except for these two peaks here uh, we have two decimals correct of the sine function and actually it gets a lot better uh, close to the origin and so the shape of this uh, error function actually remains always the same we have the oscillating nature we have the wobbles and then we have the peaks towards the end um, so we actually talk about interpolation uh, but if you like um, you could say that uh, my interval was uh, here minus pi over pi but i can say look i'm going to take uh, an interval where everything is less than uh, zero point zero five so you could say that if i would have considered a smaller interval but then with some points outside the interval i have actually uh, a much more accurate uh, approximation so that's also a common sense uh, solution to picking your interpolation points All right, then, um, how can we choose our interpolation points in a good way? Well, let's look at the interpolation error. Uh, so we spent considerable time in the last lecture deriving the formula at the bottom. Uh, what is typical about this formula is that the error is zero at the interpolation points. Um, so this is a formula that we typically can't really evaluate because we don't really know the point alpha for which we may replace the function actually by this polynomial. So in, in a way we have treated this again as an interpolation problem. So it, it depends on the behavior of this n plus one derivative of the function that we are approximating. Um, so we have the n plus one factorial, which is very promising uh, because that's the factorial grows extremely fast, and we have it in the denominator. However, and we kind of have experienced this when we looked at the Wilkinson polynomial, uh, if you take, for example, equidistant points, uh, then this value here grows very, very rapidly. So what I just underlined grows quite rapidly. And uh, here is an example. So for the first nine roots, uh, so starting from zero, leading all the way to eight, so we have very small errors uh, between two and six uh, that function uh, behaves rather well but then we have huge values towards the end points um, so these values grow extremely extremely fast and I'm now remembering so one of the very f difficult exercises of the last homework collection was exactly the uh, Wilkinson polynomial. And we then had the norm of the uh, polynomial, and the norm could have been defined by the maximum value that the function can take over the interval. And you see how big that norm actually can get. Um, 
also that so we actually perhaps I should return back here uh, we actually also have now the eight factorial that shows up in the constant coefficient so in in a way we were uh, very much encouraged by the factorial in the denominator but actually we have now also a factorial in the numerator um, so that's kind of a showstopper here but we will find a way out of this um, so this is to indicate that equidistant choices uh, it seemed the common sense approach uh, because we want all our points to be separate from each other. So, well, let's take them at distance one from each other. Um, well, that's actually quite bad choice. Uh, or, or let's take them all at the same distance from each other. That's actually not such a good choice. We have the factorials coming in there. All right, so let's look at uh, Chebyshev uh, polynomials. Um, so polynomials are defined in two ways. Uh, we can look at polynomials as defined by their coefficient vectors. But actually, we can equally well geometrically define a polynomial by its roots. So what if we would take polynomials that have very nice roots and actually even better not only the polynomials it's not so much the roots of the polynomials that matter here but it's actually the size of the polynomial and uh, the size of the polynomial will be bounded on an interval if we use the Chebyshev polynomials um, so here you see the definition it's the cosine of n times the inverse of the cosine um, so in a way uh, you can see that this is only defined with x in the interval so the x here uh, should be living in the interval negative one plus one because the inverse of the cosine is only defined by this uh, in this interval um, that's the restriction. Uh, what we actually end up with is actually a major benefit, is that uh, the cosine function is actually bounded by one, takes values in negative one and plus one. That's why we had that restriction on the inverse of the cosine. Now, I keep on telling that these are polynomials, uh, but actually is the whole point of our approximation just that these trig functions are not polynomials and we want to represent them by polynomials. So now you seem to be working exactly in the wrong way. Why take a cosine uh, to define a polynomial? It's not at all clear that this is a polynomial, but the next slide will make this clear. Um, well, the next slide will not make this clear, so I'm sorry. Uh, so the next slide here, this slide now shows the shape of the uh, cosine function. So it oscillates uh, just as with the error, but actually now it oscillates between negative one and one, which is very, very good. Now, why are these uh, polynomials, uh, why, why is this formula, why is this definition of the Chebyshev polynomials actually a polynomial? Well, in this slide, we derive an alternative definition for the Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, so in a way, this is a very constructive slide. It also gives you an algorithm to compute the representation of the Chebyshev polynomials in the standard basis. Um, it's important, though, if you have to evaluate a polynomial, a Chebyshev polynomial, you must use the three terms recurrence relation for accuracy. Um, the expansion in the basis will actually no longer lead to an accurate evaluation. So in, in, in a way, the three terms recurrence relation shows that this is a polynomial, but it also provides a very good algorithm to evaluate the uh, polynomials. So let's uh, some trigonometry. Um, 
So, and let's work by induction. Well, if we evaluate uh, the formula for n, for n equals zero, we have that uh, the cosine of zero is one. So we don't even need to compute the inverse of the cosine. But for degree one, you can see that the first, or so the polynomial, not the first one, so the first Chebyshev polynomial is one, the second Chebyshev polynomial is x. Just by definition that the cosine of the inverse is the original argument again. And then we use some uh, summation of arguments for the cosine and its uh, difference. And we are subtracting and uh, we are uh, eliminating the signs. Uh, so uh, the sine functions show up. We're actually not interested in the signs now. Let's add this up. And then we apply the identity to the end argument. So A is N times the inverse cosine, and B is then the X. So actually is, is actually the, the argument for the cosine. So what does this buy us? Uh, what does this uh, give us? Well, that actually gives us the representation. So we have already seen that uh, we have a representation now for the cosine of B for that term there. And now we have the unknown end uh, Chebyshev polynomial as the cosine of A. So now we apply the cosine uh, of a plus b is the next Chebyshev polynomial. a minus b is the previous Chebyshev polynomial. It seems to get complicated and complicated, but then it kind of uh, simplifies. Uh, if we realize uh, the uh, identity here again, so we apply this identity. So this identity is equal to that identity, but now with a different notation. So two times the cosine of A is just two X. So this is the two X that is sitting here. And the cosine, I'm sorry, uh, I've underlined wrong. So uh, let me redo this. Let me try to wipe things out here. Um, so let's start again. So I am using this identity here, where the cosine of B is X. So here I have the cosine of B, which is the X term here. And I have the cosine of A, let me underline it twice, which is the unknown. Uh, the end Chebyshev polynomial. So at the right side, uh, we have what we want to know. And at the left side, we have the sum. So we just have that the next Chebyshev polynomial is the cosine of A plus B, and the previous Chebyshev polynomial is A minus B. So this gives us an identity. So an equivalent identity as a trick, as the familiar trick identity. But actually, now we can turn this into a three terms recurrence relation. So it seems that if I look to this, that Tn is the unknown, then I can write uh, one Chebyshev polynomial in terms of the previous one and the next one. But actually, I will write the next one as a combination of the two previous ones. And then actually, since everything is a polynomial by induction, that the end uh, Chebyshev polynomial is also a polynomial. So if, if by induction, if Tn and Tn minus one are polynomials, then Tn plus one is also a polynomial. So in, in, in a way, this is uh, the derivation of an algorithm to efficiently evaluate uh, the Chebyshev polynomials. Um, that could be an exercise. Uh, you see that evaluating the Chebyshev polynomials is actually linear in N. 
So if you, so the recursion, you can do this recursively, but you can think of uh, very easily this formula here. This formula is also an algorithm. So you have the initialization here with T0 and T1, and X is some value. And then to compute in every step, you do two multiplications and one subtraction. So you have a cost of 3N to evaluate the Chebyshev polynomial. So it is a, a mathematical proof. It shows that uh, the definition of cosine n times inverse of cosine leads to a polynomial, but it also is an algorithm. So we can evaluate these polynomials rather fast. Um, all right. Um, so here is another property of the roots of the Chebyshev polynomial. Uh, so we have an explicit formula. So we've seen the root finding problem. And it would be rather complicated that if for each interpolation problem we needed to solve a polynomial. But no, uh, we have an explicit formula for uh, these Chebyshev polynomials. We know that the cosine vanishes at uh, pi over 2 and all the alt multiples. Well, for the n times uh, arc cosine argument, we can uh, generalize this. Um, so uh, deriving this theorem should be can be done by looking at consecutive Chebyshev polynomials. Just plot them and see where that the roots actually occur in a very regular pattern. So, but there is an explicit formula for it, and the formula is given in this proof of the theorem. And this theorem is then proven by a straightforward um, evaluation using this property here. So we end up with this property. All right, and that is essentially Chebyshev interpolation. So I made the um, pictures in the beginning uh, in a Jupyter notebook. Um, so look at this uh, Jupyter notebook first before you start on this exercise, uh, because uh, we will use Newton interpolation again. So the main difference, why we call it Chebyshev interpolation, is because we do have, um, we choose our points uh, differently. So the point of this exercise is to interpolate twice, once with equidistant points and once with the roots of the Chebyshev polynomial. And then compare the errors, um, see if it's actually better than not. So this exercise is a more comprehensive exercise, but if you take the Jupyter notebook that is posted, it should not be that hard. So you replace the sine function by this function here. Um, and in a way, this exercise is already an introduction to what is coming. You see that uh, this function is actually a rational function. So it's a quotient of the numerator is a very simple polynomial one, and the denominator is a quadratic. So if you were to, uh, to, to approximate this function with a rational function, then actually it would all be good. Uh, so in, in a way, uh, this is an exercise that shows kind of the limits of what we can do with uh, polynomial interpolation. Um, but we're not restricted to polynomial interpolation. So the course does not end here. So also the chapter on approximation does not end here. Um, so, but uh, how good is this now? Um, so, uh, why did we actually do the Chebyshev uh, interpolation? Why, would we, why did we do this? Well, we did this uh, because we wanted to, to bound the magnitude of the error function. So, the, the error function uh, also grows in magnitude like a factorial, uh, and that's actually not very good. Um, so what we will show is that uh, the cosine function, uh, the cosine function is 
found that we, do, we don't need to show this, we know this already, that uh, the Chebyshev polynomial is bounded in value by one. But if you work on the uh, recurrence relation, you actually see that uh, we have the two times x factor coming in there. So, and uh, the magnitude of the function is actually, has this two to the power n minus one factor coming in there. So what this means is that uh, the important relation is at the bottom here. So what is the bottom line? Uh, the bottom line is that uh, the product of all the differences with the Chebyshev roots is actually also growing exponentially, uh, declining then, but it's decaying exponentially. So you have the two to the power n minus one sitting in there. Um, so you see what is uh, done here is expanding these polynomials. That's actually a very bad idea. Uh, I only did the expansion to show where does the coefficient two to the power n come in. And uh, this expression here is what they call a monic polynomial. So this is a polynomial that is uh, has a leading coefficient one, it's monic. So the Chebyshev polynomials are not monic. Um, but we know that uh, the Chebyshev polynomials they actually are cosines. Um, so if the Chebyshev polynomial is actually less than one everywhere over the interval negative one, one. So that implies that uh, this monic polynomial here that shows up prominently in the error function has to compensate for that leading coefficient in the Chebyshev polynomials that grows exponentially. So in, in, in a way we have exponential growth and we have exponential decay. We have exponential growth in the leading coefficient of the Chebyshev polynomials. That's like a very bad thing. So especially if you start to expand these things, don't do it. Um, you use a three terms recursion if you must evaluate. So, but because of this leading coefficient and because of the property that it is actually a cosine function, it's roots, if you divide out that leading coefficient, then the term in this error function actually must decay exponentially. So, and that gives us again, a lot of confidence in the interpolation process. Now, interpolation is a bad idea to use outside the interval. Um, so, interpolation works well inside the interval, but outside, because of this exponential factor, um, this exponential coefficient, the, the uh, errors are actually quite large. So even here on the plot, I've even divided by this uh, 2 to the power 8. So then actually you see that uh, this function still uh, grows very fast. Um, that's because of the degree of the polynomial. Um, outside the interval negative 1, uh, it's not such a good idea to evaluate polynomials far out. So two is already quite far out. So th th this also corresponds a little bit to the picture early on in the course of the number line. Uh, so the number line, we've seen that there are many, many numbers close to zero. Um, so if you can uh, scale to the interval negative one, one. And that's where we end up next. Uh, so if you have to interpolate, we interpolate in the interval negative one, one with our Chebyshev points. But sometimes we want to, and most often probably, we want to know outside that interval. Well, we can always map the points from negative one to one into any interval. 
So here the formulas are displayed in their full glory. Uh, for the running example with the sine function, we actually were interested in minus pi pi. Uh, so there you can see that it's a very simple, this is a simple case of the formula where you multiply pi by pi. And uh, the pi is the length of the interval divided by two. So this factor comes up here again. Um, so you can see that if you add the beginning point to it, so minus one gets mapped to one and B gets mapped uh, and the plus one gets mapped to B. And you can then find a formulation for uh, the uh, interpolation points in the interval, in any interval. And also we then have uh, the um, modified uh, the modification to the error term so now i call the uh, ti's are now the interpolation points in the interval um, a b and you can see that uh, the contribution to the error term it still has this factor this decaying factor to the power n minus one sitting in there but we also have the length of the interval that plays a role um, so in some sense, you can see that uh, the longer your interval, um, the more you are at risk to losing uh, the very good property of the exponential decay. So there's again an exponential coming in here. Uh, if you must, uh, it's good. You can uh, go to an interval A, B. But actually, if you can, it's always better actually to map everything in the interval negative one, one. All right, um, let's uh, stop the interpolation. Uh, now start from Taylor functions and use Taylor functions to build rational approximations. Um, so we, we actually encountered Taylor many times already. So Newton interpolation is actually a discrete analog of the uh, Taylor series, uh, albeit a very coarse one. And, and But the next term rule also kind of explains what the truncation error is. Um, so here we start with the Taylor series, we expand around uh, the origin, it's also often called a Maclaurin expansion, uh, if it's around zero. And the order of the error is where you trade. Uh, so here, if you do not go too far out, if X is not larger than one tenth, then, the, then you are sure that the error of your Taylor series is about of the order 10 to the power minus five. So in the interval uh, from zero to zero to one tenth, and also from negative one tenth to one tenth, you can be sure of four or five decimal places. Um, now we will, that's already often quite good, but sometimes and most often not good enough because Taylor series are actually absolutely horrible once you get farther away. Um, so definitely, you shouldn't evaluate the Taylor series expansion past one. Uh, so how can we improve this? Well, we can improve this by a rational approximation. Um, so here we will introduce this with a very simple example where we want to approximate um, a function by a quotient of two quadrics. Um, so this problem in general is not fully specified um, because of uh, the fact that you can multiply both the numerator and the denominator by a non-zero constant and then still have the same rational function. So dividing by zero is a bad thing, and uh, we want to kind of avoid this as much as possible, and we fix one of the coefficients. As a matter of fact, we could have fixed any of the six coefficients, uh, but we will fix uh, the constant 
of the denominator. Uh, so if it so would happen that the B1 and the B2 would be zero, then we would have a polynomial. Uh, and that's not wrong with that. Now, um, observe that we have our Taylor series given. So what is given here, so let me mark this in green. So what is given are the leading coefficients of the Taylor series. So we have five of them. And what we want to compute are the five coefficients. So three in the numerator and three and two in the denominator. So we also have five. So this actually gives us uh, already a very strong indication that this problem is very well defined. So the size of the input matches the size of the output. And we will uh, determine the coefficients so that the error, if we subtract the Taylor expansion from the uh, rational expansion, that the error actually, and we, we, we put this on the same common denominator. So here, this expression here, we should actually have the error equal to zero. So in this expression that we solve will involve the given coefficients of the Taylor series, the truncated Taylor series, the P. It will involve the unknowns, uh, the Bs of the, new, of the denominator and the unknowns of the numerator. And it will lead to a linear system solving. So here it is. Um, so we have our five coefficients, the given coefficients. Uh, we have the unknown coefficient of numerator and denominator. Notice that we will, are not multiplying unknown coefficients. So the unknowns appear linearly. Um, now we have the x and the powers of x sitting in there, and that's kind of distracting, distracting us. If we want to write this equation down, so actually the slide was probably not long enough, but actually this is an equation zero equals this expression. Um, and uh, this is all equal to zero. So if we expand this, this is actually, I will use three inequalities. So this is an equality between polynomials, not an equality between numbers. So two polynomials are the same everywhere for any x if their coefficients are coinciding. So this gives us the so sorting it out, uh, arranging the polynomials, uh, collecting all the terms with the same powers, gives us then uh, the equations that we need. And you can see that uh, it's actually linear, uh, but also it is a decoupled uh, system. So we can compute the coefficients of the denominator separately from the coefficients of the new. So this decoupling is a nice property. So we, and that actually simplifies the problem. So we have to solve a linear system, but the size of this linear system, so it's at the bottom right here, the size of this system is actually in equal the size of the denominator. So we can evaluate, we can compute then the numerator coefficients by simple evaluation. All right, so here is the example. Uh, so if we take uh, the sine function and truncate after uh, at the fifth power, so we actually truncate after uh, x to the power three, but you did the sine function is an odd function, so it only has odd powers. So the error is x to the power five. We do have, and actually, Putting this error term here is important because I'm actually using 
uh, this uh, term here. Um, so I'm actually really using uh, five terms when I compute, even though it looks like I have only two terms in uh, the Taylor series expansion, I actually do have uh, five terms. Um, so I have three zero terms that you should not forget. So in some sense, this exercise, it's a first example, but it could be a little bit confusing if you forget to write down the zero coefficients. So also there appeared zeros in uh, the numerator and in, in the denominator and into numerator. So this is a paper and pencil exercise. Uh, so the system is so easy that one can read off the solution. And computing the values for uh, the numerator is also a very straightforward evaluation. Uh, the main difficulty with this example is that one should not forget the zero coefficients. And we obtain a nice uh, rational approximation for the sine function. All right, so here you can see it. Um, so we have uh, the approximations. So you see that within the interval, it's already very, very close. Uh, so um, although I mean, I'm sorry, within minus one, one, uh, the approximation is very close. Uh, so it's actually getting closer. So we have the blue sine function. We have the red, um, the red uh, uh, Taylor series. And then the green is our rational approximation. Um, so you can see that the green is already starting to approach the blue very much closer than the red. Um, so I picked this example uh, at a very low degree where you can see the, pros, the progression already. Um, the next exercise will actually allow, will actually compute a better approximation. So uh, the algorithm it can be derived from the formulas. Uh, so it's a good exercise. So the next exercise will ask you for a ratio of two cubics. Um, you could do this very systematically and set up the matrix and, of, and the coefficient. So the coefficient matrix and the right-hand side vector of this uh, linear system. But you can also do this uh, in an ad hoc fashion, uh, preferably actually now using the backslash operator to compute the denominator coefficients. So you will see that uh, with this uh, cubic approximation, you already have an extremely good uh, approximation for the sine function. And that's actually the main point of body approximates. Um, OK, so um, one other application. Uh, how do you evaluate this? Um, so if you have a continued, if, if you have a rational expression, um, if you look at this expression here, the cost is um, expressed. So just just why do we do this um so it seems like we are only going to save a couple of arithmetical approximation uh arithmetical operations but uh these approximations for the sign and the cosine they are evaluated very very often when we make a plot so actually saving a couple of operations uh, can save substantially uh on a repeated application. And how can you uh, replace multiplications by an extra division? And this is what they call a continued fraction. So you divide the numerator by the denominator polynomial. And you write down the remainder. Uh, so this is done here. 
So you still have, uh, it seems a little more complicated. Uh, you seem to have um, now the sum of, uh, of two terms, and the second term is still a rational expression. But observe that the degree is actually less. So the degree of the numerator has dropped from three to one, as expected, uh, because you are dividing a cubic by a quadratic. And you can repeat this process if you invert the fraction. So here we simply rewritten. So uh, the second part here is rewritten. So the second term is equivalent to this term. And now you can do the same game. So you have a quadratic that you divide by a linear. And that will then give the final expression. So this is what they call a continued fraction. Because you can continue this process until you have a constant in the numerator and uh, something linear or something, no, you actually stop as soon as you have a constant in the numerator. And if you count the number of operations, so this is a completely equivalent operation. Um, of course, now you have to be careful with x equals zero. Um, so well, one has to be a little bit careful. Um, so uh, evaluating the original expression at zero lead it to zero, one may into trouble with the um, other expression. So a bit careful here. But uh, the, the punchline is that we have fewer operations. Now, here one last uh, application of uh, the Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, we will see this, uh, so the integrals come up. Uh, we will see this more in greater detail and exploit this in greater detail, the orthogonality property, when we get to numerical integration. So the uh, Chebyshev polynomials form on an orthogonal basis. So that's why they actually also are better to represent uh, the polynomials. And, and we will use this property to rewrite a polynomial in the standard basis into the Chebyshev uh, basis. So here we have the matrix representation of the transition of the uh, Chebyshev polynomials, the given Chebyshev polynomials into the standard monomials. So this is the standard monomial basis. So if you like, this is a dictionary. Uh, you can read of the coefficients of uh, the Chebyshev polynomials by looking at this two-dimensional table. So you can look at the matrix as a dictionary, a coefficient table. That's one potentially good use of that table, uh, but actually a better use is to look at its inverse. So this is a triangular matrix that is invertible, and the inverse will actually tell you how to write any polynomial in the basis of the Chebyshev polynomials, which is a much better basis. And why do we do this? Well, I'm running a little bit uh, low on time here. Uh, one application is to economize a power series. So you can take a truncated power series and transform this into the Chebyshev basis. So if you work with the Taylor series approximation, you can make it more economical more efficient to evaluate if you do this rewrite. And this rewrite is essentially doing this multiplication with the inverse. So this can be done symbolically. Uh, so this could be a SymPy exercise. Um, now the problem, uh, so why do we do this? So first of all, we get again a polynomial. Uh, so in the basis, if we span, expand it again, but uh, observe that the degree is much less. Uh, so we started out with a higher degree polynomial, and we end up with a lower degree polynomial. 
So this polynomial can be evaluated much more efficiently. And with lower degree, we will still have a much more uniform error. And this is exemplified here. So if you look at, and, and the approximation that I took was the uh, exponential. Um, so the exponential function over the interval 0, 1. You see the original truncated Taylor series approximation in blue. And in red, we have the economized uh, approximation. And you see that this is very, not only economical, but actually also as far as error goes, uh, quite good. So the Taylor series is actually better around zero. So this is an error. So the blue here, you could say if you look locally, uh, you should actually use the Taylor series approximation. And probably the best thing to do. But observe here that you actually have with a cubic polynomial two decimal places of the exponential correct uh, over the interval 0, 1. So over the interval 0, 1, you can replace the exponential with a cubic polynomial, which is not bad. Uh, two last exercises. So to these exercises, uh, uh, invite you to go a little bit farther. Um, so I think I may have solved exercise three already, uh, but exercise four is interesting um, as well. All right, I will stop here. Um, and next time we will continue with a more geometric uh, view on approximation and introduce uh, splines.